Joe, what is up? Happy to have you in the studio. How you doing? Also, first time we've met in person, which is crazy. First time we've met. <laughs> first but, time we've met. Um, we got a ton of great feedback on the last podcast episode, and so looking forward to doing part two today. And I want to get it started with a post that you made about a couple weeks ago. And I'll just pull out a, a note here that said, the market has changed more in the past 12 months than my previous 30 years in the business. Mm -hmm. And so would love to dive into a little bit, like what are the dynamics that are changing? How should companies respond? What's going on? Well, I usually will go from the point of view that I have uh, and, you know, talent access, 12 months has changed. But I think we could say that about the world, right? So anything that was going down a certain path uh, was either accelerated or clearly had a uh, bullet put in its head, uh, to put it plainly. In the talent access world, um, you know, and, and that, that really should be important to every company because, you know, people are our most important asset. We hear that all the time. But, man, the way things are going right now, force multipliers will change the way a company moves. And once you get a force multiplier as a hire, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a dynamic that takes place as you bring in four, five, six, like, assassins in regards to talent. Um, they do 50% of the work if you're in an organization of what, like, I think the, there's a, there's a principle out there, um, a square root, square root of the number of people do 50% of the work. So, mm -hmm. you know, organizations that go out and, 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 and have a good process, meaning know how to put out attention and awareness content, build a story around their organization, build a hiring narrative, tell a story will, and let people longitudinally follow that. And then eventually lean in when they're ready to lean in, not just hiring the best person in the first 60 days that you need to have the opening. That's going to change the dynamic of the workplace. And where there's an enormous gap, Chris, is HR has always been responsible for hiring. And they're ill-equipped. You and I have chatted about that mm -hmm. in past things that we spoke about. But right now it's going to become really evident because the onboarding of WFX work culture right? Work from anywhere, work culture. Um, people wanting a, a dynamic work environment to come in on uh, when they want to come in. And then also access the talent around the globe now instead of within a one hour radius. If you are not prepared and on the leading edge of that inertia, that flywheel of talent is going to get taken up by first movers. And then you're going to get the scraps with everything from behind. And you'll be, you'll be inconsequential in your business vertical if you don't move first on that yeah because in that case you you miss out on the force multipliers right you miss out on the force multipliers and and it's not a straight line function to the bottom like once one thing goes wrong and then the second thing goes wrong that then starts to become a precipitous drop off it's not just like oh we're we're losing market share every year you know this especially mm -hmm. in the digital world you know, there's, there's number one, sometimes you know who number two is, and then nobody ever knows number three in a category. Mm -hmm. Yeah, other things you noted in the post, so uh, work from home, we'll probably cover a little bit more of that later on. You also mentioned salary bans, relocation policies, home office subsidization, um, training opportunities and budget for remote teams. Like mm -hmm. what are some of the things that are going on in those subjects? So yeah, let, so let's start with like, I've, I coined this little so, sort of concentric circle it's community, tribe, and micro tribes. I think the organizations that have a headcount of more than you know 30, 40 employees, you have to form a community. And that community, like in our organization, I'd say probably a third of our team is virtual now, maybe more. I'd have to do the numbers exactly, but it's in that area. Uh, 19 months ago, I wouldn't have had a single person virtual. Like I just did not believe in it. But I didn't believe in it because I didn't experience it and I wasn't forced to explain it. So we constantly keep a sense of community. And our virtual or remote people, we don't use the word remote. I don't want the remote word because it's us and them, mm -hmm. right? So just a team member, just a team member. And community, tribes, and micro tribes. I think you're going to start to see organizations start to drop into pockets. Just like we're here across the street from you, Amazon's coming in, right? So why don't we look at what the big giants are doing? And if you're a smaller company, why would you not have a small WeWork micro tribe in an area where you can get two or three employees because community and tribe is still important. So they want to meet twice a week at a WeWork. So three people get together and collaborate, right? So I, I think you're going to start to see that the community as a whole engage digitally, sort of the tribes in regional areas and micro tribes, which will be working together 
and getting together either uh, electronically, digitally, or in person. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Um, the second one, WFX, work from anywhere. And I don't use work from home because this is where it's going to get really sticky and it's going to be fun to watch over the next couple of years. So how do you justify, okay, I have a home out in Telluride, Colorado, right? If somebody worked for me and they were working in Delray Beach remotely because I have some people who work remotely who live less than a mile from the house and still haven't been back since COVID. They're mm -hmm. crushing it, right? But what if they go like, okay, I'm going to go out. And then I have somebody who comes into my office all the time. And the person who lives in Delray, but doesn't come into the office, goes out to his house in Telluride and works out there. Is he or she on vacation? Does it matter? Doesn't matter. Well, what about the person who's in the office all the time and suddenly has three weeks of vacation on his or her offer letter? I mean, how do you work that? How, how, how do you manage that dynamic? Or... You know, Billy Bob, who works remotely, goes out to pick up his prescription for two hours and comes back. Nobody's monitoring that. But if Fred, who works in the office, goes out for two hour lunch and comes back, he gets the hairy eyeball. And it's because, you know, we've been bred and trained as 50 year old men and women and 60 year old men and women who are the leaders and culture setters of organizations today to think like that. And it's really hard to overnight stop that. Mm -hmm. That comes into the dynamic work environment, right? Like the flexible policy. How do you think about that? Well, look, you know, we all we all entered into this with a giant throat punch, as I call it, you know. And so your reaction to a throat punch is rarely the ideal one. You know, we go fetal right away. Whenever we're attacked, we go fetal. That's how we're wired as human beings. And this entire world went fetal. And we had this response of work from remote. Everything changed. Yet we really haven't evaluated that, I think, deeply enough in regards to the dynamic that's going to occur over the next five years. And so I, I'm a little worried that our, it's rare that your immediate response to an attack is the best one. Your best is to survive the attack and then go to your toolbox to see how do you fight your way then out of the attack, right? And so what happened right now is the entire world went fetal after it got its throat punch and have settled into this is what it is. And this is where I come back to the worker has the most power in the history of labor in the world. And we shouldn't give it back. And I say we, because right, I believe in the worker. I'm worker empowered. Companies just happen to pay my check, mm -hmm. right? And so right now we should not be giving that power back as a worker, but we also need to be sensible because if we skew too much towards one end of the spectrum, these companies are gonna become less profitable. And then therefore jobs are going to start to get lost or jobs are going to be compromised in regards to salaries. So as a worker, we've got to be teammates with the employer and really be sensible and think about this longitudinally. What's the best arrangement? Not what's the best arrangement for me as the worker. And that's where I think we have to get our headspace. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect segue. I was just going to go into hiring offers, interviewing. You said that the dynamics are changing a lot and companies need to respond. I'll point out one of them here about speed up your process yet don't compromise it. Like let's talk through some of the things that companies need to adjust in their hiring process. Mm -hmm. So in regards to the hiring process, first of all, what, what is that experience? You know, was it a great robotics company yesterday up in Waltham or down in Waltham, right over the road up to where we are right now across in Waltham. And, um, what is the experience when you walk out of, out of that interview, whether you get the job offer or not, that's the very first thing an organization needs to ask itself. What is our process? What is our customer service rating? Because if you interview seven people for a job and one get it, the other six are more important for your brand than the one person who got it. Because the six who are leaving, if they got ghosted in the interview, if they were treated less than optimally, if they weren't disengaged with, right? Those people are gonna go talk about that experience. Take it from me, in my, in, in, in my career, I hear about all of the lousy interviewing process. Rarely do I hear the good one. So that's, that's really important. Offers right now, the numbers we're keeping, individuals, once they pick up their head in this marketplace, are interviewing in less, no less than three different places, plus their current employer. The counter offers are flying around right now. Bad idea to take a counter offer, but they're flying around right now. So if you're not start to finish with your interview process, less than 15 work days, you dramatically decrease your odds of being able to land the person you want to make an offer to. Mm -hmm. 
That's really interesting, right? So the process is moving quickly. There's other companies competing for the same talent. If you're moving too slow, other companies are going to have the offer out. It's going to be good. You're not even going to finish your process by the time that person gets hired. Right. And, and keep in mind too, interview processes are very indicative of company culture. 100%. So if you cannot have an, uh, an expeditious hiring process that is also, let's call it complete deep and is instructional to the person interviewing. Like that's a whole nother thing is like, I'm, I should be selling you 80% of the interview process. If, if I want to hire you, mm -hmm. I should absolutely be selling you. Um, and, and then, so that entire process doesn't need to be compromised. What it needs to be is, is given the respect it deserves. If you want to get the force multipliers we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the idea of accepting a counter offer as being bad. I think a lot of people like understand that, but would love to go into the details as to why for the listeners. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, when, when, when you go out, when you've decided to look for a new, a new opportunity, a new role, a new job, whatever it is, you generally have thought about this pretty deeply. Sure. Everybody leaves on a Thursday night or a Friday night and they got reamed on some report they didn't do well. And you have a less than optimal supervisor. And you're like, I walk, walk out on a Friday night and I'm, like, ah, I'm done with this place. You know, Monday morning you come in when you really start thinking through it. I'm like, okay, it's a pain in the butt to look for a job, right? I mean, I know where the water cooler is. I am, you know, pretty high in the pecking order. Uh, I really don't want to expose myself and put together a resume. I mean, it's a big lift. So when you finally decide to go out and look for a new opportunity, odds are, you're, you're, you're not excited anymore about what you're doing in the company you're at. And, you, and, and, and listen, unfortunately, a lot of people are walking zombies in their life in regards to their jobs, not careers. Like a lot of people have jobs and that's different than a career. And so when you decide to look there, you have logged enough hours, either consciously, unconsciously in your brain, like this is not for me anymore. It's just not. And so you go out and you go on the interview process when that's like the unknown, the, the, the the interviewing process is pure chaos. Like you, 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 like you go out there, it's pure chaos. You, you have, you have, you have order because you know where your car is in the parking lot. You know where your desk is, right? You know where the coffee machine is. Everybody knows your name. That's order. Mm -hmm. When you go look for a job, that's pure chaos. And we, and most people don't operate well in chaos. So when you've made that decision to go out and throw yourself into the chaos, and then they make you an offer and all of a sudden it becomes very real. Now your new employer doesn't want to lose you. It costs so much money to replace you. Or if they do want to lose you, they want to do it on their terms, not on your terms. So they want to let you go when they have a nice tidy package right now, you know, you're going to be a sort of a real challenge if you leave. Mm -hmm. So when you accept that counter offer, you've already signaled to your boss, your partner, your supervisor that ah, I don't like it here anymore. And so in the back of their mind, your promotions are going to be limited all the time. They threw money at you to keep you. You're always going to be looked at suspiciously. Like you, you are not one of us because you wanted to leave. And I think the stats are, I think it's 80% of people leave within six months after they've accepted a counter offer. I should know that number by heart, but it's, it's changing quite a bit now, but never a good idea to accept a counter. -offer. That is a pretty crazy stat. 80% I think is the number. So moving in. So we talked about speeding up the process. There was a couple other notes in here. Uh, you mentioned make the strongest offer possible and obviously offer doesn't come only into base salary. So we'd love to talk through one, just how do you make the strongest offer po possible? What does that entail? And then other levers that an organization could use outside of just pure comp. Sure. So people in general, look, we always have to pay our bills. So comp's important. Base bonus, LTIs, meaning long-term incentives, whether it's options, RSUs, right? It depends what level you're entering a company. Then you also got holiday time. Uh, you also have early reviews. You should always be looking for an early review. Uh, if, if you're stuck on a salary and you know, it's, it's on the razor's edge, you're trying to thread a needle, no problem in having a six month merit review for another three to 5% increase in the salary on both sides. I would negotiate that in any job I was going to almost all the time. They'll give that to you for the most part, right? So holiday, uh, early reviews, sign on bonuses. Um, and then, uh, uh, I, I also suggest, you know, seminars uh, I have put in enough offer letters. Like somebody's like, I want to make sure I go to these two industry shows per year and you pay for them. And I want to go to these two seminars, maybe a project management certification, PMO certification, something like that. All of these things need to be negotiated. 
And on the client side or the company side, you want to send a signal to that person that I want to invest in you and educate you. Because one of the things, the number one, the number one thing you should be looking for is upskilling and reskilling and ongoing education in your current employer. In other words, if I was sitting in an interview with somebody, I was like, tell me about your policies and your budget and your commitment to upskilling and constant ongoing education to your key employees. So these are all the things you need to look at when you're considering an offer that covers about 85, you know, relocation is in there, all that. But, mm -hmm. well, but when, when you're, when you're making your offer, always know a candidate always should negotiate at least one time. And so I have tough guy clients who are like, we make one offer, one offer only one offer only. And that's it. If they don't want to work here, then that, that, that's their fault. Then we find that out early. I'm like, Oh, please. <laughs> what a knuckle dragger comment. Right. Right. <laughs> So look, expect, expect that an individual is going to come back and want to pull one or two levers. And when you make an offer, you make an offer. Here's our base salary. Here's our bonus. Here's the other things we're thinking about, you know, 401k, profit sharing, all that. Um, this is what we're proposing. This is our best offer right now. We might have some movement in these areas, but I'd like to know what your thoughts are on this offer. And then what that does starts to inform me on the, as the employer is what are they fixating on? Do they want to take their base from 125 to 132 after taxes? What is that like $3,000? That's like a pack of cigs and a six pack a week. Or would they like to negotiate something else different? So I always want to say, this is our best offer. There are some levers I can pull. Think about it. Let us know because if I'm not in the ballpark, then I need to know that right away. And I don't even want to put a written offer together. So the offer is not official. Mm -hmm. Here's what we're thinking about. Let's save everybody a, a lot of time instead of running it up the ladder, running it to the comp committee, getting it signed off, having HR do it. And then you got to come back and revise it anyway. And it shows the collaboration as a hiring, as a, as a hiring company as well. Mm -hmm. Another thing I think companies tend to do is they find somebody that is definitely great for the job, but they're always like, but maybe there's going to be someone that's a little bit better and let's just like wait it out. What would like, what would you say in to those types of people in this market right now? So that was an email that I had to open and read this morning, um, with a company up here in Boston and, um, they're, they're a, a Japanese U S based company, huge. Okay. And they're hiring a very high level role for one of the executives. And they're like, we love her. She's awesome. Um, We'd like to keep her on hold and see who else is out there over the next two or three weeks and compare her. Meanwhile, they've reviewed about 14 resumes, interviewed like seven people. And, you know, at that point I'm looking at it and go, are you even just mildly aware of the job market right now? Are you mildly <laughs> aware of how long this role has been open? Are you mildly aware of, of the great talent that is being scooped up out there? So when somebody says that, say, look, I understand that, but we might as well just cut this person loose. Well, what are you talking about? No, we should just cut them loose because statistically speaking, or if we're working with them, we've asked them, they're interviewing on two other things. So how would you like me to go back to them and say, we like you a lot. You might be the person, but we're going to see what else is out there first. And then we'll come back around. And man, I would be, I'd be like, see ya. yeah, gone. <laughs> gone so but what you have to do is toss that back to the client but mm -hmm. understood how would you like me to articulate that to the individual especially for me because that person is if you think they're a force multiplier like you need to get that person in there yeah or how about this let me play it the other way okay. mr company <laughs> i'm the candidate give me your offer what i'd like to do is take your offer and then shop it to the other places i'm interviewing and see which one might be better. It's the same request on the other side of the table. Mm -hmm. How would you feel about that, Mr. Hiring Manager? I think that's the reality <laughs> of the world. Right, right. But I'm like, cool, make me the offer. I'll get back to you because I got two more interviews in two weeks and I'll see if I'm going to take your offer. I mean, come on, it's the same thing. You can't have a one-way street in today's employment environment. Mm -hmm. There was there was one thing that you wrote that I don't see a lot of people talking about that I thought was really interesting, which was the um, the the premise is you join a company, maybe it's twenty people, um, it's a rocket ship, so it's growing really fast, and at some point, um, 
they hire an executive above you and you talked about how to respond to that and would love to talk uh, about that because I imagine it, it's happened to me in my career before. I imagine it's had, happened to a lot of people. What's the right way to respond to how that happens? Some people will just be like, well, if you're going to hire someone above me, then fuck you, I'm out of here. Like, what do you, what do you think's the play there? That's right. <clears throat> so most of the things that I write are things that I'm thinking deeply about, or I just hung up the phone and that is the dynamic of the phone conversation I just had. I mean, I'm really blessed to be able to have the, you know, thousands and thousands of these deep conversations per year. And out of them, I try and protect the privacy of the person who I just had it with and also share the story with, you know, the, the, the people that follow me. And so this happened about three weeks ago. Uh, there's this great lady who works for this rocket ship of a company. I mean, a rocket ship in the, in the, in the med tech telehealth world. And she got hired really early uh, and was put in a senior role. And I've done this in my company before. It's like, with all the data I have, I'm going to put you in that senior role, right? But as companies grow rapidly, you have more data that comes in, meaning I have more needs. I have to expand the size of the organization. There's different market dynamics occurring. We expanded out our tech. We have more opportunities. And suddenly that person who was in that role at that, let's call it a director level, is contextually not in the director skill set any longer. And so what you got to do is you've got to bring in somebody above them because, right, the company has to live. Mm -hmm. Now you need to have a conversation with that person and they don't have to agree with you, but they have to understand the dynamics. And the flip side as well is if somebody, let's say your company doesn't come to you and say, listen, Chris, you're a director, we're bringing in a VP. And the VP we're bringing in is going to be clearly a lot more experienced than you in a very specific area that we need help in. And so I want to let you know as other opportunities come up and they're going to be robust, you've seen, you're, I'm going to bring you to the table on those. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pissed. I feel bad, right? I get it. I totally get it. But I hope you appreciate the communication and I want this to be ongoing. That's the conversation that happens. But if your company doesn't have that conversation with you, you need to go down the hallway, knock on the door of the CEO and say, listen, we've got to talk. I get that this is a rocket ship. Totally get it. I want to stay here. This is not a threat at all. I want to stay here. What I need is another opportunity where I can showcase my skills and I can grow a skill set that will continue to make me valuable for this company and valuable for the future market. Would you please think about that for the next 30 days and come back to me with something that would probably be worth a discussion that I would get jazzed about, but would first of all add value to the organization. Because if we're growing that quick, again, keep in mind, here's the key. Mm -hmm. If the organization, look at your organization. I mean, you and I were talking about our bulk growth of our organizations over the last year, mm -hmm. right? Tremendous growth, more information coming in now and opportunities and decisions we have to make than ever before. And last month was entirely different than this month. So that those opportunities are going to exist in these rocket ship companies. You have to be mature enough and you have to get that skill set and that confidence to have hard conversations with peers and supervisors all the time. Because you're in the vehicle already, right? Like I talk a lot about being in the right vehicle um, as in terms of a company we talked about on the last podcast, all of the pillars that go in there. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to, because from an emotional reaction, move out of a vehicle that's going to take you really far and go and flip a coin, you know, on a, on another opportunity. Yes, that's right. And, 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 and keep in mind that up until somebody got brought in above you, this was the best job you ever had. So why all of a sudden, and, and you brought up something, you know, never let pride or ego dictate strategy in anything you do. So your knee jerk reaction to getting pissed and finding out all the fault of the new person who came in, Right? You need to figure out, okay, what can I learn from him or her? And then what can I take on for the company? And what signal can I send to the CEO of this company that, look, I'm mature. I thought this through. I was pissed. I want you to understand why I was pissed. I get it. I want the company to be successful. What do you got that I can showcase my skills again that gets me another at bat mm -hmm. with you? How do you think, um, if we take a step back, because mm -hmm. that was awesome. If we take a step back from the company side, how do you recommend that companies evaluate that decision, right? So um, about deciding whether or not to hire someone 
um, on top or whether to promote. Do you have any insights on that? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm going through that right now with one of my other companies. Um, I've got two VPs. They're both really good at what they do. But one is really set up for where we're going over the next 24 months. And there's a skill set there that is really needed. And um, you've got to think through the collateral damage that's going to occur on that, knowing that you know, you've got people's lives in your hand. I, I take it very seriously when I move these pieces around a chessboard, especially as you get up to that higher level of executive leadership. Like, man, you know, you're, you may lose somebody when you make that decision, right? And that's why you want to handle it as maturely and open as possible. Having said that, when you do bring in somebody who is in that upper echelon, I strongly recommend from my experience that you overhire dramatically because if you're going in that direction and you're hiring to meet the current need, you're going to be looking for another leader in 12 months from now. So you need to overhire that, increase your budget by 20%. And then the person who potentially is being chose instead of is going to look at that person and go, well, that's a no brainer. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm still pissed about it, but that's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's really important is once you start to get at the VP level in any size organization, five people or 50,000, there needs to be a, 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 just a very blatant over hire on the role. Noticeable difference in talent. Noticeable difference in talent from those sitting around the leadership table and those who are, you know, sort of shit talkers at the water cooler, right? Because, because, <laughs> right, right. But then more importantly is if you're going to be disrupting your senior leadership team, you've got to make sure that you're going to accelerate so quickly, you're going to be able to pull up, let those other people behind draft up to be on that rocket ship to take advantage of other opportunities. So that VP you brought in, she, because of her, she created so many opportunities below her for others that thought they were gonna hit a ceiling. Mm -hmm. And that's why you wanna overhire that. You know, critical thinkers, really smart people. Let's talk about hitting the ceiling. Yeah. Um, so I've been an employee at companies where essentially the department that I worked in wasn't growing very fast, mainly because of just how the company thought about marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you think about either from a company or an employee perspective about that reality, right? So the company that I was at working at was growing fast, 50, 100% a year. Um, but the marketing department wasn't growing. So how do you think both candidates and employers should respond? To? I wonder if employers recognize that employees feel that and then also wondering how employees should respond. Hmm. So let's look at the employee side, first of all. So, and it goes back to really heat mapping the organization. So you want to look at it and say, okay, what market is my company in right now? And is it a promising market? Is it a high growth market? Or is it a market that is just going to be flat? So that's number one. The number two is, okay, what is my company doing to address that big market? And this touches on the four pillars a little mm -hmm. bit. This is why the four pillars are so valuable because they're, they're an analytical tool for decision making when you're either looking for a job or you're running a company or you're making a career decision. So what's the market look like? What's the growth look like? Then what does my company look like in regards to that? So let's say that company you were at was growing that quick. Boom, boom, great. Okay, what is the budget in relative terms in the group I'm in or in the division I'm in versus the overall budget of the organization? Because that informs me quite a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah? Because where's that spend? And then dependent, if we're talking about a marketing department, right? So I don't know if you were in marketing, if you were yep. an engineer. Okay, so marketing. Right now, and, and you know, this is, this is self-serving for both yours and mine content, there's a bifurcation that's occurred in the marketing world. There's the way they used to do it, and then the way that it should be done in today's current market, which is going to change month over month. Mm -hmm. What should we be doing? Because the rate of technology, you know, user interface, meaning the customer, uh, multiple platforms, uh, a service driven world instead of a product driven world. So you want to look at that and say, OK, what are the tools? What's this? What's the what's the philosophy of the leader of my group? Like, because if the philosophy of the leader of the group is not mapping towards progressive moves, 
then you might as well either just put your head down and expect you'll be doing the same thing three years from now and learning nothing or decide that you need to get out of there and then look for who you want to become. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to do. And what do you think on the, the company side? Do you think companies recognize this or how does that work? Hmm. No, is the first answer. I'm trying to, <laughs> no, <laughs> I think great leaders recognize it. Um, I do also believe that you start to hit a challenge with being able to satiate, you know, more than 20 or 30 people in your group. It's very, very difficult to give, um, everybody, you know, equal footing on an equal opportunity. Um, and from the, from the, from the company side, it's really important to understand that every human being wants to do a couple of things. They want to learn, um, they want to grow, uh, and they want to be part of something amazing. Now, if, if you don't check all three of those boxes, you're not a force multiplier. And so I, I don't want to be, you know, cavalier about this, but if you don't want to learn, grow, right. And be part of a killer team, well then there's your desk. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause I have an accountability to the family. I always say, you know, uh, logo team self, that's the order that you have to serve. If you're building an organization, what's the ethos. When I say logo, it's the ethos of the company. It doesn't mean the actual, you know, Coca-Cola <laughs> logo. What is the logo, the ethos serve the team, then the person, if you do it in that order, the person always gets served. And so, you know, what you've got to do is as an employer, you've constantly got to be upskilling and teaching all day long. If you're, if you do that, your retention goes through the roof mm -hmm. and then you've got to have an amazing product and or service that people are proud of and look around and say, there's nothing like this in the world and create that environment. Right on. Cool. We're going to pivot here. Okay. I, I know that you, um, probably interact with a lot of CEOs, but also a lot of people leaders or HR leaders. And so would love based on your experience with, I imagine hundreds or even thousands of, of these, these leaders, when it comes to a people leader, what are some of the top traits that you see in, in people to really get stuff done at large organizations? Mm. So, um, The one thing I'm watching a lot of right now um, is, is, and these are all push-pull, all push-pull concepts I'm going to give you. Mm -hmm. The number one is empathy tied closely to accountability. Like I've watched leaders over-index towards empathy and allow responsibility of the person you're, you know, bestowing your empathy on to not have responsibility. So the best leaders are the ones who can sit there and, and understand what's going on with you in a conversation and empathize with you and just say, cool. Now what you need to do is put the burden on your shoulders, the biggest one you can carry and start carrying it. Right. And this is, this, this goes, this goes to all the things we spoke about earlier in our conversation is how are we going to manage the WFX environment? How are we going to manage the people who don't want to come into the office? You have to empathize with them, but then you have to stare right across and say, do not let it impact the profits of our organization. We'll work together on this. So leadership, empathy and responsibility, demonstrate empathy, empathy, but demand responsibility back. Right? So that's mm -hmm. one. The second one is I would say, keep in mind that what you're working for as a leader or owner is outsized relative to the person who's working for you, right? So I see too many owners, entrepreneurs, CEOs, VPs who are doing their 12, 14 hour days and then are getting pissed at Johnny who's coming in and only putting in an eight or nine hour day because there's a misalignment of goals and there's a misalignment of ROI on the efforts. So you either give Johnny a bigger piece of the pie or cut Johnny a break, right? But again, you have to overlay the empathy and the responsibility to that. And then I do believe communication. I work with a personal coach. Um, I had to start working with one about two and a half years ago because I had some gaps in my game, mm -hmm. um, gaps that I was not aware of. And I would say that the best leaders make time for the leaders that report into them. Like I've, I've had to load my calendar up 
um, with an extra probably eight to 10 hours a week, which is already at 60, 70 hours a week, spending it with my leaders. And all they want is time, mm -hmm. right? All they want is time. And, and I, that was one of the, I think, profound learnings for me is like, dude, that you just, they just don't want to see you working hard and, in, and, and insane and creating great opportunities. They just want a little time with you. Mm -hmm. And I think the best leaders recognize that and carve that time out. Yeah. Yeah. You were talking, I was thinking through like the, the people leader position, right? Chief people officer, VP people. And it feels like, like you mentioned the bifurcation in marketing. I think if you look at it, there's actually a bifurcation in almost every function going on right now. Sales, people, um, finance might be one that's like relatively stable, but marketing, product and engineering, there's a lot of bifurcations going on in terms of talent, um, which is super interesting. I'm going to pivot here because I have one that I'm just like, I'm really interested in your observations. You work with a lot of different companies. Um, I've seen this in small pockets as a, just an observer, but why do you, what do you think are some of the biggest reasons that culture breaks down? Well, first you have to define culture, right? Let's define it. First we have to define culture. You know, the culture are not foosball tables and free meals and, you know, dog walking and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, first of all, I'm a dog lover. Let me say this, right? I'm a dog lover. I came into Chris's place here. He's got a gorgeous dog out front who was howling at me, I wish we caused that, right? So when, when did it become okay to bring a dog to an office? Okay, that's not culture, mm -hmm. right? And, and what happens is, you know, we, we, we've been working for hundreds of years and not had to have our dogs at work, right? So I'm using that as a sublime example of free snacks, bringing your dog to work, foosball tables, beanbag chairs. That is not culture, right? Those, those are pacifications that somebody is buying you and not really improving you. So culture to me is a, is a, is, is, is a demonstrated evidence in an ongoing basis of um, who will I become when I go to work at your organization? Like that to me defines culture. Mm. That's the question that everybody should ask when they sit across at an interview table. Who am I gonna become after my next three years here? Who am I gonna work around? What are you gonna invest in me? And then how am I going to return that investment you put in me back to you? Like to me, culture revolves around um, the, the, I don't want to use the word programs, the, the activities an organization has to improve you as a human being. Like that to me is culture is because people want to evolve. Mm -hmm. They want to evolve intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, physically, they want to evolve. So it's not free gym memberships, it's not climbing walls, it's not that kind of stuff. That to me is candy for culture. Mm -hmm. For me, the best cultures in the world are constantly making me a better version of who I potentially could be six months from now, nine months from now, a year from now. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get retention. And retention informs culture. Higher retention, higher um, baseline of culture. Low retention, low baseline of culture. Mm -hmm. In regards to culture, do you think, how do you think mission plays into culture? Or do you think that it's separate? I'm always suspect of people who have mission statements, right? We, we, we put these, we put these, like they're up on a pyramid in Gaza, right? We etch them on the wall when you come in our lobby. And there are these words that, you know, um, do they have any meaning, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I understand a mission, right? But the mission should be changing all the time. Or the mission itself should be something that could never be attained. Mm -hmm. because the second you put a flag in the ground is when you've limited the opportunity to look behind the, beyond that flag. And so to me, if a mission is going to have any sense in it, it's going to be something, one, that we could never possibly achieve, right? It will always be that Valhalla that we can always pursue. Mm -hmm. And it should never have, you know, I don't want to be number one in something. I don't want to be 100 million in sales. I, like people ask me that all the time, what's your, what's your goal next year? Like I have no goals. Like what do you mean? I so said, why am I going to gate my organization on something that we're not going for? I don't want to be winning at the end of the first inning, like, or even at the end of the third inning. Yeah. So I think it's really important that when you have a mission, I think that everybody needs to understand what are we trying to 
I don't want to say change or disrupt. What new category do we want to create? Like that, that's, I, mm. I would say if you ask a TMG mission, and I had this, I, had, I was interviewed the other day about Dragonfly and 160 Studios and TMG 360 Media and TMG Search, like what is all that about? I'm like, I want to create a new category of business and business solutions that does not exist. And we provide so much value that our demand will be driven just by that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to me, mission should be, what are you creating that does not currently exist, that the market may not even know it needs right now, but when you do tap it on the shoulder, wink, wink, iPhone, um, it changes an entire category. Mm -hmm. That for me as a business person it would, is my mission. So now that we have a good understanding of cul culture, hmm. why do you think are some of the reasons that culture breaks down? And that when we're going to talk about retention next, but let's talk stick through culture right now. Well, I think, I think culture breaks down because if culture is a transaction, um, it falls off pretty quickly. So if you're, again, let's go back to, you know, the, the, the candy culture, you know, the free snacks, mm -hmm. the wall climbing, uh, the dogs at work, what kind of competitive advantage is that? And, any any organization any organization can match that down the block, so it becomes a race to the bottom of a commodity, candy driven culture, and so that's what breaks down. So it goes back to my original: is you need to properly define culture. Mm -hmm. Culture is not the free snacks, mm -hmm. but that's what breaks down because it's it's a bought commodity culture. Great culture, which is driven by the development of the human, the development of the person in the organization rarely breaks down. What it does is it continually sort of sheds who it is today and moves on, sheds who it is today and moves on until it almost becomes a religion without being, you know, sort of, you know, spiritual about mm -hmm. it. It becomes a religion. And some of the best companies in the world exhibit that. You know, I think Simon Sinek talks about that Let's, real quick. And I want, to, and, and this is the, I like Simon. Um, some of his stuff I don't, but some things I do. Is he he, he gives this example? Is like when you went to Microsoft's um, annual meeting, ninety percent of their conversation was talking about Apple and how to beat Apple. When you went to Apple's annual meeting, a hundred percent of their dialogue was around educating the world. So that is like. You cannot aim your culture or your mission at beating somebody. You have to aim your culture and mission at who are all your people going to become and how are you going to change the world or how you're going to disrupt the category or again, better language. How are you going to create a new category that does not exist today? And the best organizations that have that culture that never has never broken down are those that are creating brand new categories and want to change the world. The ones that always break down are the candy culture and those that are trying to beat somebody else. I've also experienced, um, I think in actually quite a few organizations, uh, lack of executive alignment can really hurt culture. How do you see that? Well, those are people who are managing careers and not caring about logo ethos, mm -hmm. right? So you have executive pissing matches going on. And some of that is, 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 is is our gunfights and knife fights over who gets the C-suite, right? Mm -hmm. And then that's the CEO's responsibility to make sure he or she creates an environment that that sort of misalignment does not occur. It's okay to totally disagree on, on an approach. Having said that, though, you all have to align on pursuing that approach. And the second that there's an alternative agenda, and if you think that the people next to you and below you don't see your alternative agenda, you're really sort of numb mm -hmm. because it, 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 it speaks very quickly in every move you make in an organization. People do not understand. Leadership never understands how naked they really are running around the hallways of their organization. Mm -hmm. Let's pop to retention. Uh, you mentioned retention being a, an indicator of culture. Mm -hmm. So um, would love to talk about, um, about that generally would also like to balance voluntary versus involuntary and talk through some of your thoughts there. Yeah. So the, the, the top cultural drivers are compensation, um, acknowledgement of effort and uh, clear opportunity for you to grow. Um, 
again, financially, emotionally, spiritually, mm-hmm. um, and as a human being. Like those are the three. You you check those three boxes, and you pay attention to those three boxes. Your retention will be much higher than the norm. You know, there's there's a few other things you can toss in there, but those are the three levers I pull. You know, I uh, our firm by far is the highest paying search firm in the industry. And so people are like, well, why are you giving away? I'm not, no, I'm not giving away. It's like those people brought that value and I will never want to lose somebody for money mm-hmm. ever. Now, if they're insanely, you know, uh, uh, unreasonable on expectations, well, then they didn't belong here anyway. And if they've been with me long enough, they would have left before then for more money. So money, money is important. You got to overpay your players because mm-hmm. team cohesion is critical. You know, we watch football teams. I'm up here, you know, you watch the Patriots. They lose one key player in one key role, no matter how good Belichick is, right? We're going to lose three games a season because we had to go out and find somebody, learn the new system. Everybody had to slow down the truck. We had to run that player through the drills. He or she's got to learn the game book. We don't know how they're going to move when I'm not watching them. Man, if you're a well-oiled team, you do not want to lose that. So that cohesion is important, and you buy that by acknowledgement, paying people well, and giving them chance to grow. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about the um, the difference between voluntary and invol- uh, involuntary departures? You mean firing somebody? Um, uh, so I think it's more on the on the company's perspective of when somebody is departing, mm. whether you you know were okay with them leaving or not. I'm right? never okay with a person leaving. Um, I always want to know why if they're leaving on their own. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's always you can always learn from that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've had people leave me that. Um, it's probably best for them and best for the organization to leave for sure. No problem with that. Um, I always want to understand why they're leaving. Like, what did I miss? Or, Mm -hmm. you know, I knew they were going to leave eventually. Like we've got, it's pretty predictable in our organization of who's going to be a long term player there and who's not. Um, because you know, the wheels start to come off in regards to the high bar that's set in our organization. There are people who are working their way towards it. So I always want to know when somebody leaves the organization, I always want to understand why and where they're going. Exit interviews are useless. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you always want to go after them 60 days, 90 days later and be like, hey, I was just sitting around thinking, what can you do to inform me as to um, while you were here, what would you have liked to have seen more of? And if you don't want to take my phone call, I totally get it. If you want to drop me an email, totally get it. But it would be really cool if I understood that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you got to be ready for the medicine. Because it's going to be medicine. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Cool. Joe, we're, ra- we're wrapping up here. we got a couple yeah. more questions to pull through. So um, for the, the listeners here, there is a ton of investment going into cloud right now. I saw a new fund that was opened up yesterday for 3.1, with $3.1 billion in assets. And so um, for those companies, how do you pre- – like when you take an infusion of cash and you're prepping to hire a lot of people, how do you manage that? How do you prepare – what are some of the things that, that you should think about doing right? Yeah. So um, this is what we're really good at our organization is, is, is turning the fire hose of reality on people. So when you're going to have a mass hiring, I'll give an example. We did something for Google and J&J a couple of years ago. There were 300 and something people to bring on board. Um, first, you have to do the math backwards. So if you're going to hire 300 people as a placeholder, you're usually going to interview at least four people per position. That's 1,200. Now, you're going to usually have three interviews, a TI, a telephone interview, or a Zoom interview, and two in person, right? Now, you're at, what is that? You're at uh, 3,600 interchanges, mm-hmm. right? Figure out how many work days a year they are and do the math backwards on that. So, first of all, you've got to get the process down because you and I chatted earlier about what's the experience. So, if I'm going to hire 300 people and 1,200 people are going to come through my door, 900 are going to become ambassadors. So, first of all, figure out the logistics. That's mm-hmm. number one. Number two is, and, and I, all the big hires, all the big hire initiatives we do is get your lightning, lightning rod hires in the door first. What's a lightning rod hire? Lightning rod hires are people that are iconic in one fashion or another in the industry that you're in. They have a following, they have a brand, they have a reputation. Because once you start to get those lightning rod hires in, then they attract others who are best in class who weren't looking in the first place, but would love to go to work in an organization that, you know, based on evidence and money coming in, let's talk about the cloud situation, high growth, 
high opportunity, um, clear, aggressive thinker on the lightning rod hire. And if he or she is lightning rod hire and hires me, I'm in their inner circle right now. So I would say functionally get all your lightning, lightning rod hires in. What it does, it's going to reduce your time to hire because they're going to have their own network of people, mm -hmm. right? And you're not going to have to pay search fees and you're not going to have to count on just posting things up and seeing who shows up. So I would say those two things is don't disrespect the process and, and the exhaust that's going to come out of that process. Um, and then get your lightning rod hires in first. If you can hit those two things with a level of excellence, you're 80% home. Love that. I'd never thought about the concept of a lightning rod hire, but it's super interesting. Cool. Joe, I know that you got to be heading out to another meeting shortly, but before we get, get there, if you have any questions to pass over to me, we'd be happy to jam on that. Oh my gosh. Shit. Um, <laughs> I have so many, <laughs> you know, I, I guess the, 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 the one question I would have is look, I've, I've really admired what you've done, uh, first at a distance and now we're actually getting to work together. So I don't know if we're allowed to say that on there, <laughs> yeah, that's but, cool. <laughs> uh, I, I have me who thinks he's reasonably good at the demand gen marketing and building brand. I had to come to the master for one of my other companies I have to take the helm with uh, refine. So there's a, there's a little bit of a validation there. Um, so as a leader, what have you thought about you're, you're running a really interesting company and mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, you're clear, um, thought leader in this, you've done a great job, job of demonstrating. You've hired a lot of people. What is, what are the two or three things today that you had no awareness of 12 months ago as a leader of an organization such as refine? Like what was like, holy crap, I didn't even think about this. It's a really, it's a really interesting question. Um, so some of the things that I, uh, hadn't thought about is one, I just asked you the question about the, what you need to do when you're hiring a lot of people. Once we have 15 job openings right now, which is a lot more than when we were before, which was like one, two, three. And so that's been really interesting. Um, as we scale up, looking at key executive leadership hires has been, um, something that was just out of my line of sight 12 months ago, um, which has been really interesting. And the last one that I think is really interesting for people is product pipeline. Go, so thinking what, about, tell me about product pipeline. Yeah. So the, the, the things that are top of mind for me generally right now are one category design. We talked about that a little bit Two product pipeline and three, uh, bringing in the best, bringing in and retaining, developing the best people mm. in the industry. So those are the, the three main things. Um, when it comes to category design, what we're thinking is that, um, a lot of people bucket us into an agency. Um, and what I think where there's a key difference here is that we actually have developed a new system. And so when you think about from a sales perspective, sales bring in like Sandler or challenger or different things like that. And some consultant shows up and gives you some training and then lets you go. Mm -hmm. And we bring in a system, but we also embed experts into the organization to help implement that system to a level where it's actually successful and way more rapidly than a company can. What, what do you call that? That's something that we've been talking through and trying to figure out because it's clearly different than hiring some agency to go waste $50,000 of your money and not take accountability to results. Mm -hmm. So category design is one of them. Um, product pipeline is, is the next one. So while we, um, at the moment have a, you know, high touch consulting offering, we are developing products that are actually products, whether, whether it's content, software, other things like that. And so trying to figure out how does that pipeline come to life? Where are they differentiated? When are we going to launch? How are we going to bring them to market? How does that fit in and ideally get accelerated and amplified by the existing business? And so thinking through that, and that's really interesting from a talent acquisition standpoint as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and the third one, we, we spent the whole interview talking about it is talent, right? So as you, as you start to move, we're at probably 35, 40 people right now, you recognize the difference between a B player and an A player. Mm -hmm. You recognize when you get a force multiplier in your organization, you recognize that the, the path there is promote fast, get that person to where they want to go quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are some of the, the key things that I've been thinking mm -hmm. about. And as a leader, um, 
I think I learned this early on too. We really had our explosive growth and I know you recognize this already. We had our explosive growth the moment that I realized that I did not have to be the expert at everything. And, yeah. and, and I learned that um, if you take 100% of me and pit it against set six people who can be 80% of me, they crush me all day long. Totally. And so that was as an entrepreneur, I still watch entrepreneurs still try and control everything because they may be the smartest person in the room, but 24 hours in the day, right? And then your explosive growth always comes once you start hiring the force multipliers, get out of their way and just keep saying yes to them, mm -hmm. right? I've learned that. I mean, I, I still would not be on LinkedIn if I didn't listen to Giovanni Laricella, who came into my office. He's, you know, he's one of our partners. He's like, this LinkedIn thing, I'm like, oh, it's garbage. Don't Just get on the phone and talk to people, G, <laughs> right? And again, that's an example of, he took LinkedIn and showed us the way with it. And I'm like, wait a minute, you got something here. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, right man, on. I, I love this. For those that can't see this, I'm looking out over, I'm seeing the American flag here, which is really jazzing me. Right, I like squares. Blowing center. in the wind. Blowing in the wind. It's like, it's like <laughs> contrived because I'm, I'm probably the biggest Patriot, not Patriots fan, I'm a giant fan, sorry, <laughs> in the world. And then I'm seeing these beautiful boats going down. What river is this? Uh, this is the Boston Harbor. Boston Harbor, right? So if you get a chance, um, first of all, try and get on the show here. Great interviewer, but second, gorgeous uh, here in the seaport. Thanks for having yeah. me as a guest. Joe, buddy. awesome to have you. Great to see you. You got it. Be well. Yeah. Awesome. That was fun. Right on, brother. Hopefully that was fun. you got what you wanted out of it. That was great. I liked it a lot. Yeah. Good questions.